In the evangelism world, there is something called the Romans Road to Salvation, which is a method of communicating the gospel message using key verses in Romans 3, 5, 6, 8, and 10. Instead of taking the Romans Road to Salvation in this video, I will take us through what I'll call the Romans Road to Messianic Judaism. We'll visit Romans 1, 2, 3, 9, 11, and 15 to see why we, a collection of Jewish people living out our shared faith in Yeshua in an identifiable and recognizable Messianic Jewish community, are here. Let's start at mile marker 1, the good news. Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. Let's begin with Romans 1, 1 through 4. It says, Paul, a slave of Messiah Yeshua, called to be an emissary and set apart for the good news of God, which he announced beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, he came into being from the seed of David according to the flesh. He was appointed Ben Elohim, son of God, in power according to the Ruach, the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. He is Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Yeshua is Lord and Messiah. Without him, there is no basis for our identity and community as Messianic Jews. He is a Jew himself, a descendant of King David, the only Jew to never transgress the Torah's instructions. He is the Lord and Messiah of Israel and the whole world as predicted by the Jewish scriptures. Yeshua is the cornerstone of our identities and of our community. It is through faith in him that we receive the Holy Spirit, enabling us to more reliably and more wholeheartedly avoid sin and live holy lives. It is around him that we orient our communities and ways of life together. It is through him that we are in a deep relationship with Adonai. Without him, there is no Messianic Judaism worth adhering to. We are here because Yeshua is Lord and Messiah. Now to mile marker 2. This good news is for Jewish people. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We Jewish followers of Yeshua are here because 1. The good news is in fact the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts. Yeshua is in fact our Lord and Messiah, proved by God raising him from the dead. And 2. Because people like Paul, a Jewish follower of Yeshua himself, proclaimed this good news. As we see in the book of Acts, he proclaimed this good news to Jews and non-Jews. We ourselves heard this message proclaimed by our family or our friends, by Christians or other Messianic Jews. If we had not heard this message, then we would not be here. We have a responsibility to do the same thing and share the good news with our fellow Jewish people and others. This message is the primary message of our community. We are here because the gospel was shared with us, and we are here to share this message with others. Onwards to mile marker 3. Unity and distinction within the body of Messiah. Romans 3, 29-30 says, Is God the God of the Jewish people only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one. He will set right the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Throughout Romans, we see Paul's audience of Gentile Yeshua followers were struggling with understanding Jewish and non-Jewish identity within the body of Messiah and a theology of God's relationship with the people of Israel in the wake of Gentile acceptance of Messiah and Israel's denial of Messiah. Here, Paul asks two rhetorical questions. Is God the God of the Jewish people only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Paul answers in the most Jewish way he could, with the Shema. In the Second Temple period, during which Paul wrote his letters, Jewish authors like Josephus and Philo often abbreviated the Shema to God is one. Paul does the exact same thing here. We can ask why does he do that? Let's look at an earlier use of God is one in Zechariah 14, 9. Zechariah predicts a coming age when Adonai will then be king over all the earth. In that day, Adonai will be a chad, will be one, and his name one. With Zechariah 14.9 in view, 
A later rabbinic legal commentary, compiled around 200 CE, called Sifrei on Deuteronomy, shares a Midrashic commentary on Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, The Lord our God, quoting from the Shema, then commenting over us, the children of Israel. Then quoting the Shema again, The Lord is one. And then commenting over all the creatures of the world. Then again, quoting the Shema, The Lord our God, and commenting, in this world. Then quoting the Shema one last time, the Lord is one, commenting in the world to come. As it is said, the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall the Lord be one, and his name one. Quoting Zechariah 14.9. This Jewish tradition understands Zechariah 14.9 as saying, When the nations turn from their idols to worship the God of Israel, in that future day, the Lord is one. This Midrash is a Jewish textual analysis of a Jewish prophet's writings, looking with hope toward the day when all nations serve the God of Israel. But for Paul, this age has begun with the coming of Messiah Yeshua. God is one. And Paul holds that the sustained distinction between Israel and the nations showcases that God is the God of Israel and the God of the nations. Imagine this. If Jews shed their Jewish identity upon accepting Yeshua as the Messiah, that communicates to Jewish people that Yeshua is the Messiah of Gentiles only. If non-Jews adopted a Jewish identity upon accepting Yeshua as the Messiah, That communicates to the nations that Yeshua is the Messiah of Jews only. But if upon accepting Yeshua as the Messiah, Jews remain Jews and Gentiles remain Gentiles, all Israel and the whole world will see that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel and the nations. This logic extends to God himself. If Jews and Gentiles remain Jews and Gentiles upon dedicating their lives and worship exclusively to the God of Israel, This communicates to the whole world that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world, and the God of the whole world is the God of Israel. Imagine what impact this theology would have on the world right now. So we understand now that here Paul uses an abbreviated form of the Shema, God is one, in a way much like earlier Jewish scripture and later Jewish tradition in the context of recognizing an age when the God of Israel is the God of the Jewish people and the God of the nations. Paul punctuates this distinction as remaining within the body of Messiah in the very next verse, Romans 3, 30. He says, He will set right the circumcised, that's the Jewish people, by faith, and the uncircumcised, that's the Gentile nations, through faith. While there is no distinction between Jew and non-Jew in regards to the good news, which is for salvation to everyone who trusts, It is very important to notice that Paul maintains a very Jewish division of the global population. There are Jews and non-Jews. While the gospel is available for all through the same means of faith in Messiah, Paul did not see this faith in Messiah as a faith that dissolves distinction between Jew and non-Jew. Paul relentlessly maintains this distinction throughout Romans. At this point, you might be wondering, but why? Why must this distinction remain? The simplest and what should be the most powerful answer is that this distinction must remain because God commands the distinction to remain. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20 says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, let him walk in this way. I give this rule in all of Messiah's communities. Was anyone called when he had already been circumcised? Let him not make himself uncircumcised. Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Let him not allow himself to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping God's commandments matters. Let each one remain in the calling in which he was called. As we have seen in Romans 3.30 and will see in Romans 15.8 and in other letters like Galatians and books like Acts, The word circumcision is being used in a figurative way to mean Jewish, and uncircumcision to mean non-Jewish. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul explains that God has given us our Jewish identities and that we are not to shed our Jewish identities as followers of Yeshua. 
The same applies to non-Jews. They are not to shed their non-Jewish identities as followers of Yeshua. While being Jewish is no better than being Gentile and vice versa, God has given us our Jewish identity and instructs us to live according to those identities. We are here because the distinction between Israel and the nations remains within the body of Messiah. God has given us our Jewish identities and Gentiles their Gentile identity and instructs us to live accordingly. Now to mile marker four, unity and distinction within Israel. Romans 11, one through five says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he knew beforehand. Or do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Adonai, they have killed your prophets, they have destroyed your altars, I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So in the same way, also at this present time, there has come to be a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Paul begins by emphatically affirming God's continued faithfulness to Israel, despite Israel's broad rejection of the gospel, and he emphasizes his continued Jewish identity and embeddedness in the Jewish community. He then insists that despite the perplexing rejection of the Messiah by the majority of the Jewish people, God has not rejected Israel because he has already chosen us. Then, Paul mentions us, Jewish followers of Yeshua. We are the righteous remnant within Israel, prophesied by Isaiah, as Paul mentions in Romans 9, 27 through 28. Paul uses Elijah and the remnant of the 7,000 as a prior example of a remnant existing within Israel and the rest of Israel rejecting and reviling the righteous remnant. I believe the tension and rejection we currently feel with the majority of the wider Jewish community is the byproduct of God's plan to bring the gospel to the fullness of the nations and to save all of Israel. I believe this because of Romans 11, 25 through 29. It says, For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own eyes, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, The Deliverer shall come out of Zion. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the good news, they are hostile for your sake. But concerning chosenness, they are loved on account of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Here, Paul shares what he calls a mystery. For some incomprehensible reason and in some inexplicable way, God placed a partial hardening on Israel so that the gospel goes out to the nations. It is then through the gospel going out to all the nations and the fullness of the Gentiles coming in that all of Israel will be saved from sin. Don't ask me why or how, but this is the mystery Paul explains. For all the nations to receive the gospel... Israel had to be partially hardened, and for all Israel to be saved, all the nations must accept the gospel. For some mysterious reason and in some mysterious way, God has partially hardened Israel in order to save all of Israel. If Israel is hostile to the good news of Yeshua, and our primary message and core aspect of our identity is the good news of Yeshua, it makes sense that there is hostility toward us. Our being a minority remnant within Israel, our being ostracized in many parts of our Jewish community for some mysterious reason is part of God's plan. I've been in several other Jewish spaces ranging from Reconstruction, Reform, Conservative, Modern Orthodox, and Chabad. Often my faith doesn't even come up when I'm in these spaces, but I still feel the weight of questions like, do I share? Now, later, in what way do I share? Do I accept an aliyah? Is my presence the completion of a minion? What if they are angry if they find out after the service because they don't consider me to be Jewish? Because other times, when my faith was known, 
there has been visible inhospitality, and other times my Jewishness has been explicitly denied, despite being halakhically Jewish. And I've heard countless stories of the same and worse from other Messianic Jews. This is a rejection that Yeshua himself predicted. In Matthew 5, 11 through 12, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only did he predict this for his early Jewish followers and for us, but he faced rejection by Jewish people himself, even to the point of excruciating death, a rejection from the nations and Israel. This is a cross that we are also called to bear. Yeshua's strength that enabled him to bear his cross will strengthen us to bear a similar but much less burdensome cross. We, by and large, with some wonderful exceptions, are not welcomed as we are by our Jewish people. Yet, this dividing line of faith in Yeshua as Lord and Messiah is part of God's mysterious plan to bring the fullness of the nations and the salvation of all Israel. This does not mean we neglect striving for loving and meaningful relationships with those from the wider Jewish community, or that we do not strive to be above reproach with how we practice and share our faith. Even more, we have a responsibility to put effort into these things. I've heard many stories and have some of my own of successfully having transparent and loving relationships with members of the wider Jewish community. Be encouraged by these stories and by your positive experiences. And yet, do not be surprised when there is rejection. And so, one of the reasons we are here is because we must be a community for each other. We are only rarely accepted in the fullness of who we are in the church, and even more rarely in the fullness of who we are in a non-Messianic Jewish community. God calls us to be in a worshiping community, and a Messianic Jewish community is where you can be accepted in the fullness of who you are. All that said, this tension we feel is not for nothing. All Israel will be saved. We are Jews who have responded in the affirmative to the gospel message. Jewish people are hearing the gospel now more than ever, and we continue to progress to the fullness of the Gentiles. More and more Jewish people will accept the gospel, and we must be prepared spiritually and organizationally to welcome them into our community. This is why we are here, to welcome and disciple new Jewish followers of Yeshua in a way that honors, affirms, and perpetuates Jewish identity and life in this generation and the generations following. Finally, the destination. Messianic Jewish community, a double witness. Romans 15, eight through nine says, For I declare that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcised for the sake of God's truth, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it is written, For this reason I will give you praise among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. We are those visibly within Israel who have responded to the good news by placing our faith and surrendering our lives to Messiah Yeshua, wholly by the grace of God. As more and more Jewish people accept Yeshua as the Messiah, more and more the promises given to the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are confirmed. As more and more Gentiles come to faith, striving toward the fullness of the nations, more and more will God be glorified for his mercy. The existence and partnership of the Messianic Jewish community and the church, the combination of which constitutes the body of Messiah, displays God's truth, the confirmation of God's promises to the patriarchs, and God's mercy on the whole world. Our unique position as members of the body of Messiah and members of Israel gives us a double witness to God's faithfulness to Israel and the Messiah's salvation of Israel and the whole world. Our being here in Messianic Jewish community, living out our faith in Yeshua through Jewish modes of worship and Jewish ways of life, make us recognizable in the body of Messiah as followers of Yeshua who are Jews, and we are recognizable in the people of Israel as Jews who are followers of Yeshua the Messiah. We have a double witness. In the body of Messiah, we are a witness to the church that God remains faithful to the Jewish people. 
In Israel, we are a witness to the rest of Israel that Yeshua is the Messiah of all Israel. This double witness comes with difficulties, but this is why we are here. We are here because Yeshua is the Messiah and we have been brought to faith in him by God's grace. We are here because the good news was shared with us and we were welcomed into this community, something we must continue to do. We are here because the distinction between Jews and non-Jews remains in the body of Messiah. We are here because as part of God's mysterious plan, we have largely been ostracized from the Jewish community and not fully embraced as Jews by the church. We are here because we show God remains faithful to Israel and that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. If you learned something new or were encouraged by this video, please like the video, subscribe, and share with a Messianic Jewish friend. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.